I think the most important thing you can do is try to understand. It was a very scary time for me to say, Andrew, like, you might think I'm this confident person, but I am not. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Today is our first episode of May. That's right. And you know what's special about May, babe? Mental Health Awareness Month. Yes. And it was such an important topic that we thought we'd devote the next several episodes, including Mm -hmm. today's, to mental health. Yes. And discussions around that. Uh, We'll have a couple interviews, but today... It's just Sean and I sitting down talking, mostly about you. Yeah. Um, One of the reasons why we thought this was so important is because within relationships, your mental health kind of drives your entire relationship. And I think when it comes to having a successful relationship, you have to know how to kind of navigate your way through mental health. Yes. And not that we have learned it, done it, and mastered it by any means, but we've gone through a lot of like mental health things within our relationship. So we thought we would share. Yeah. And we just wanted to share from personal experience how our struggles and triumphs with mental health have affected our relationships. Going to reiterate, we are not counselors. (laughs) We are not um, therapists. We will include resources for those things down below. But today we just want to share our stories. Uh, Maybe you connect with them. Maybe you don't, but um, hope it helps. Yes. And before we get started for anybody who is affected by mental health. And I'm talking, you have either anxiety or you have something on the opposite end of the spectrum. Nothing is wrong with you. You can be loved. You are loved. And it's all okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. It is. Um, As Sean alluded to, though, uh, we're going to be talking about mostly your experience. Uh, We might do another episode about my experience with mental health. Mm -hmm. But it has been so interesting. I just want to start off by saying when... I have seen Sean at her worst with mental health. It seems like you're just so hyper-focused on a small thing and mm-hmm. a small aspect in the relationship that it affects um, your perspective generally and really has some negative ramifications. Yes. But we'll get into all the details about that. Before we get started, if you haven't subscribed to the show or given it a rating, please do so on whatever platform. We appreciate you doing that and it really helps us out. Yes. So, so, let me give you the recap real quick. Make a lifelong story, you know, summed up in two minutes. During the Olympics, during my gymnastics career, I obsessed over this concept of perfection. And within gymnastics, all you do is obsess each and every day on getting a perfect 10. Whatever it takes, whatever you need to get there. Uh, within gymnastics, gymnastics is subjective within their scoring. So based on how you look, how you smile, how you act, how you talk and how you perform is how a judge can actually critique you. That turned into a very unhealthy lifestyle for myself where I thought I needed to look a certain way, act a certain way and be a different person than I was in order to win. It got me through the Olympics. I did very well. I, definitely had an eating disorder at the Olympics, but not to a, not to a very, very unhealthy extent. My eating disorder and kind of addiction came after the Olympics when I no longer had that foundation of gymnastics to kind of put my obsession into. So I had to look for other places. And when I got thrown into Dancing with the Stars and kind of the limelight, it opened me up to a lot more criticism that wasn't performance based. It was just based off of who I was and how TMZ caught a picture of me. And I spiraled and went through very long years of just trouble with mental health and depression and identity. And I I kind of my outlet for all of that was in trying to control my eating. So I would take every supplement known to mankind. I became very addicted to Adderall. I took ephedrine in very unhealthy doses. I tried every fad diet. I tried not eating. I tried all of it and ended up fast forwarding. I met my therapist and nutritionist in 2012, 2011. She changed my life. Um, She truly brought me out of that kind of hole that I was in step by step, day after day, year after year. I still talk to her every once in a while. 
And I will never forget the first phone call I ever had with her or not the first phone call, but I will never forget the phone call I had with her where I told her I was pregnant. This is with Andrew and I's first pregnancy that we ended up losing. But I remember telling her and she was so ecstatic. And she said, Sean, tell me what, like, what's your biggest fear? I said, my biggest fear is that I won't eat enough for our baby. And I remember she just started crying on the phone. And she's like, if only I could have recorded this and sent it back in time, like 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And had you listened to it, you would have, it would have shocked you. But to wrap all that up, going into a relationship with that, I had a lot of emotional baggage and a lot of insecurities that I didn't know how a future spouse or someone I dated would be able to kind of sift through or sort through or deal with. And with Andrew, I don't even remember like the first time it was that I brought it up to you. But I remember when we started dating, I was still in a very, very unhealthy place in life where to try to describe an eating disorder. And Andrew and I have had many, many, many conversations about this where I try to explain it. For me, an eating disorder was basically every thought I had in a day. And I'm not exaggerating. Mm -hmm. Every thought was around what I ate, how I look and how it would affect how people perceived me and what they thought of me. And when that went into dating, almost every thought I had at the beginning was, what does he think about my outfit? Does he think I'm thin enough? Does he think I'm muscular enough? Is he judging me that I'm eating a salad or a burger? Or does he notice that I'm hiding ice cream in the back of his refrigerator and binging and purging is he like noticing these things and it just consumed my every being and do you remember the first time I brought it up to you because I don't know I don't I it took a while it did take mm -hmm. a while for I feel like you to feel comfortable admitting maybe even to yourself yeah that it was that bad a problem and then also to me I do want to say that I'm proud of you and thank you baby I know that it's been a struggle and one that I can't fully relate to or understand. But even though that's the case, even though I won't ever have a full perspective on your battles and struggles with it and how far you've truly come, mm -hmm. I'm thankful that you have put in the time and effort mm -hmm. and reached out to people, put yourself probably in an uncomfortable place, probably experienced some degree of shame mm -hmm. in doing so. Mm -hmm. But you being honest with yourself and seeking to improve an area that you know needs to be improved makes me love you even more. So thank you, baby. I love being able to reflect back on and see how far you've come as far as the issue at hand though. Mm -hmm. I just thought of this and this was not in our notes, <laughs> but it made me think of our first date in LA. Do you remember Mm -hmm. we, we've talked about our first date a lot. We've never really gone into the nuances of it, but essentially I flew out and met Sean at the <laughs> drop of a hat yes. uh, because she invited me to literally sent a midnight text said, do you want to fly out to LA? And I did about eight hours later. <laughs> and we went to this place called the Grove, which is like a outdoor mall in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Probably went to four or five different restaurants. One was like a crepe place. One was a, a burger place. One was like a bar, one was, yeah, it was like four or five. Anyway, it was all like in the same area. And I remember Sean, do you remember this? Was ordering me an insane amount of food, insane amount of all the things, appetizers and entrees and like literally, it was fun. It was hilarious, but. I don't think I, I ate anything. I don't think you did either. Mm -hmm. And granted you were on Dancing with the Stars, so it's training to a certain degree, but as I'm, Mm -hmm. reliving that moment and like your face and looking at the food and how like uncomfortable you were. <laughs> it's so interesting to think that some of those thoughts that you were having were probably about food. Oh, for sure. One, I was probably ordering everything that I wanted to eat and watching you eat it in a very unhealthy way. Mm. And two, yeah, I was probably concerned with what you might think if I ate it, which is ridiculous, but also just part of what comes with that disorder. Yeah, it's crazy. I It's weird for me to talk about these things now because I don't want to say I'm in such a healthy place to where I don't have issues. I fully do. And I still struggle, you know, every other day with like a bad thought or something. But to sit where I am now 
I feel like a completely different person than who I was back then in such a good way that I can reflect back on all of it now and see not the flaws, but where I was unhealthy. And it makes me sad, but it also makes me very, very proud of the work I've put in. And we have like bullet points here for things that I, I want to remember to talk about. But one thing that it says is like, when did I decide that I needed help? So when I met my therapist and nutritionist, who's like the same person, I ended up working with her during my comeback for gymnastics. So at the time, I didn't start working with her because I had accepted the fact that I needed help. I hadn't gotten there yet. I started working with her because I wanted to get back in shape to compete in gymnastics. And I'd gone through so many nutritionists who as they should, were prescribing me these diet plans, and I hate the word diet, but these programs where I would consume so much food and just looking at these programs scared me away. And she was the first one I found that she knew I had a problem before I did. And she listened to everything I said and she's like, okay, how about we start here? And I remember looking at her program and being like, see, she gets it which is almost sad because at the time I thought it was just someone who truly understood what was the right. Meaning she had you eat less food. She had me eat less food. And you were, you were excited about that. I was very excited about it. Cause I was like, see, she, she's doing the right thing. Whereas she was acknowledging in a very quiet way that I had a problem and she was going to hold my hand and take the first step with me. And then year after year and month after month and day after day, we kind of worked on things But I think I decided I needed help probably after around the time that I met Andrew. I feel like when I met you, you were the first person who ever, and I don't mean to be dramatic when I say this, but made me feel like a true human being and not just a gymnast and just an icon that people had watched once in their lifetime. Andrew and I have talked about this a lot, but for like my mental health, he didn't ask me a single question about gymnastics for two months into dating and it almost started to get concerning where i was like does he even know do you know who i am (laughs) do you know who i am (laughs) should i bring it up but it was so refreshing because for the first time i thought you saw me as a human and every date and every comment and every time you would say something you just reassured me that you loved me and not this like image that i had tied to a caloric intake or a bite of food Today's episode is brought to you by Care Of. If you've ever been pregnant, you know the importance of taking care of yourself and making sure that you take your prenatal vitamins. And if you're not pregnant, it's still important to take your vitamins. Yes, kind of like the whole theme of today. And what I love about Care Of Vitamins is that they're tailored to your unique health needs. Care Of's in-depth five-minute online quiz asks you questions about your diet, lifestyle, and health concerns to help address your specific wellness goals. I love their online quiz. It's like getting a one-on-one consultation with a nutritionist, all without leaving your house. And after you take the quiz, you can adjust what you get at any time based on your needs that might change. It was so easy to switch up my pack once I got pregnant. Plus, all of Care-of's products are formulated with good for you, clean ingredients that are backed by science. So I feel great about taking them. We talk about this company all the time. All the Uh, time. It, they make it so easy, enjoyable, and approachable to take vitamins. And we're excited to offer a couple of things, listeners, 50% off your first care of order. Simply go to takecareof.com and enter code couple things 50. That's takecareof.com with the code couple things 50 for 50% off your first order from care of. We'll also link that down below. Let's get back to it. You've told me stories about how gymnastics training camp was and the rigidity and expectations and I'm not asking you to go into that, mm-hmm. but it's so I'm, I'm thinking about our episode we did on intimacy mm-hmm. about like understanding the core person that you're in a relationship with, mm-hmm. not the accolades. That's not important. Not the way you look, not even your ambitions really to a certain extent. But I think that's what saddens me about being in a relationship with Sean circa 2013 (laughs) where from what you've told me, it's like we would sit down for a date and my perspective is the more 
of Sean that the world sees, the better off we'll all be. But you couldn't even see Mm -hmm. yourself to a certain degree because you're so consumed with, like if we're sitting out for a date, it sounds like I would be, I'm not going to say fully present, but like, oh my gosh, let's have a conversation. And you would have these layers of distractions Mm -hmm. that would prevent you from actually being fully engaged in that conversation or that moment. And it's like, that's a, to, to get a shadow of the person or just a, a fraction of the person is kind of the, the sad derivative effect of having this go on in the Mm -hmm. background of your mind, you know? Well, and I think for me too, that was the byproduct of, I'm not getting ready to cry. I have a raspy voice. (laughs) I I have allergies. Um, It was the byproduct of my career, which was a sacrifice worth taking. I would never want my daughter to do it. (laughs) I was about to say, you you said that, one, you you weren't that unhealthy. Is Do you view mm. eating disorders as a black or white or mental health as a black or white, like I'm healthy or unhealthy, or is it more of a spectrum? Like you No, I see. I see black and white. So I think it's, I think it's still probably yeah. an issue that I don't want to accept that I was just across the line, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think I was unhealthy. And to put any of it on a spectrum saying oh she had it worse and she did I think that's just me trying to downplay what it was I went through which I yes people go through a lot worse things but I did struggle with a disorder and mental health and I just should paint that as black and white and you're saying you're it was worth it um if I could have gone through that whole experience without it what I would wow this is a yeah restart that one (laughs) If I could go back and go through my entire career without a mental health issue, would I? Absolutely. But I think I'm a better parent and I think I'm a better spouse now because of what I went through. You're saying going through that process helped you understand things differently. A lot of things. I I empathize with a lot of people over things that are very hard to understand. Even Andrew and I still have conversations to this day about eating disorders and mental health. And there are things that are very hard for you to wrap your mind around. I remember we had this conversation once where it was one of our very first like in-depth conversations, like whatever question you have, ask it. And I'm going to go there about my eating disorders, mental health, everything. And I remember you saying, well, why don't you just stop? Why don't you just stop not eating? Why don't you just stop binging and purging? Why don't you just stop with hearing these voices in your head that are constantly telling you negative things. And I remember feeling so defeated and this is not, you did nothing wrong, but I remember feeling so defeated when you asked that because I wished for nothing more than to be able to just stop. And I I don't even know how to explain it, but it's this so consuming hole you just dig yourself into that almost takes over your identity. It's it's the devil taking over your identity. It truly is. It's almost like to relate it to like our religion, the amount of time you spend in a day thinking about say God or your faith or putting something into a positive is the amount of time I spent trying to battle negative thoughts. And that was very hard. And I wanted to turn it off. And I remember working with my therapist and Every week she'd be like, how are the voices doing? Like who's winning this week? And it was just this constant slow progression of guess what? Like this week, the good voices won and it took so much effort, but they did. Now it's so far and few in between that it's refreshing. Do you feel like part of it's genetic or is it your experience? Is it nature or nurture, if you will? I don't know. I think we all have addictions. I truly do. Good or bad. Is there a good addiction? Is there such thing as a good I, addiction? You could be addicted to candy. You could be addicted to That's water. That's not good. You could be... No addiction is good. I think we all have them. So I think we're all human and we all have... Some are more dangerous than others, maybe? For sure. For sure. Mm. Um, so I don't know if it's genetic 
I, I don't know that answer. But I think for me, gymnastics was a lot of it. And I think it's only because I was at such a young age when I was taught by the nature of our sport to obsess over perfection, Mm. to obsess over what every single judge in the world could possibly think of me, to obsess over what the national team coordinator and what doctors thought and what like that's that's where my mind lived for 20 years of my life. And so transitioning straight out of that and going into a relationship, I didn't know how to not obsess over what you could potentially be thinking. Mm. I do remember, I think we spoke about this in, in one of our previous YouTube videos, that uh, there was an article that came out right around when you and I first met about Sean Johnson gains 25 pounds mm-hmm. was like the headline. Mm-hmm. Which is wrong on so many levels, right? Like So many levels. But the unfortunate child fame and being put in the spotlight, mm-hmm. to whatever degree, rarely ends well, you know? But for, oh man, it just honestly just makes me more excited about how you've been able to deal with it. Mm-hmm. That whole making it through that process in the formative years, like where your brain is still plastic and forming the <laughs> gateways or whatever, like... Not that you fully conquered it, but you made it through that with headlines like Sean Johnson gains 25 pounds. Mm-hmm. I remember that. I remember the Today Show doing a feature on me over Mother's Day. And it was featuring both my mom and I that I had lost 25 pounds during my gum- comeback. And I was 18 years old. And that is that's scarring. People were celebrating me as an 18 year old that I had lost weight. And it. The crazy thing is it's not about, oh, Sean Johnson was unhealthy and now she's healthy. It's literally just the number that they're focused Mm -hmm. on, Mm -hmm. which then feeds into your obsession with lowering the number on the scale because that's what people are celebrating. Anyway, on in related news, can I bring this up? Because I just heard this today. Uh, A couple German Mm gymnasts had a competition and instead of coming out in leotards, they came out in unitards, full body Mm -hmm. unitards. Great. As a statement against, uh, you know. Female, females being yeah females being judged by body type and i said wow it seems like that might be a healthy step for the sport uh yeah i know it, it actually says in the code that you can wear a like a unitard if you want to and they should not deduct from that and i think that's amazing i think our sport has slowly made progress to celebrate athletes for truly their gift and their their performance and their skills rather than what they look like. I hope it continues to go that way, but I think that's beautiful. It should be. You don't, you don't watch skateboarding X games and be like, Oh, why is he wearing those clothes? Why does he look like that? You literally watch his skills and you're like, that was insane. Mm -hmm. Gymnasts are doing the same thing. We're putting on a performance for you of some of the most difficult skills that human beings have ever attempted. And I think a judge should look at that and say, holy crap, a 16-year-old girl just did this and stuck it. They shouldn't be thinking, ah, if only she looked like a little thinner, it might make this whole vision look better. Well, I'm just, I was, when I heard that, I was thinking about um, in my sport, football. The clothing is strictly functional. Where mm-hmm. it's like you have to wear pants that have knee, like they go below your knees for knee pads and like the, th- the pants are tight to hold in all the pads and you have the jersey that you whatever. And if a unitard is just as functional as a leotard, mm-hmm. then why not? But but the name of the sport technically is artistic gymnastics. It is, which is about the artistry of your performance. And within the code, which is like the rule book, it states that a judge is judging off of the artistic representation of your performance. So I'm performing 10 skills on floor. How can I make this look like a, a piece of art? How can I stitch together movements and dance and music but within that we've gotten a little lost and I remember being on the national team and being it it being so ingrained in me to say oh your hair better look like this and your makeup needs to look good and your leotard should be tight enough to where there's no wrinkle so a judge will think it's not fitting and I I grew up in that world of obsession that yeah I 
it should definitely be the other way, but I don't know how you get there. Yeah. That's kind of where society's at. That was a tangent. But it is. Re- to <laughs> reinforce, well, and it's cool. It seems like there's some progress being made. But um, to go back to our relationship, I remember you mentioned earlier, like, kudos to me for being able to go through that as a child and now be kind of healed of it. The question is, like, how did I do it? And I think a lot, I get that a lot. I have a lot of people message me, collegiate gymnasts, young girls saying, I'm struggling with this. How did you get to where you're at? My parents were so instrumental. They never skipped a step in my entire life in saying, I love you for who you are. Do not, like, don't ever let someone tell you differently. And I think having that consistency really helped me because I had so many opinions being thrown at me that at the end of the day, I could at least listen to my parents. And yeah, I would, I would scream at them. I'd say, you don't know what you're talking about. I'd be like, yes, I gained 30 pounds. You know, you can see it just re like I would, I would tear them apart because I was so unhealthy, but they always consistently told me what they believed, which was, I love you. I think you are beautiful no matter, no matter what. And I think another huge part of that healing process was finding you because you were the same way. I think you are truly a human that sees inside someone's soul before you see the exterior. And I felt that from day one. And I was really scared, but like very early on, you and I, I threw it at you. I was like, oh my gosh. I think within like our first week of dating, I was like, all of our followers and like the media is going to come after you. Literally, that, no, that was our second date at the lake. I freaked out. We had a big discussion about we it. We did. And you were like, I don't care. And I was like, you don't understand. I was just, I was worried because I, I saw, may, I, maybe it's because I saw my future husband and I didn't want you to leave, but I got so freaked out. And then I don't remember the first time I brought it up, but I remember feeling the need to tell you. I think it's because I was starting to hide my phone calls, we were spending enough time together that I had to hide my phone calls with my nutritionist. And I feel like I had to hide. I hid the Adderall from you for years. I hid the substances from, from you for years. I hid the obsessions and I, you know, I, I tried to hide it all. And when our relationship got serious, I felt like you should know. And I don't remember how I introduced it to you, but it was a very scary time for me to say, Andrew, like, you might think I'm this confident person, but I am not. I'm trying to think of the things that a partner or friend can do to support someone who struggles with any type of mental health battle. You mentioned two things to recap. One, the consistency of your parents' love mm-hmm. is important. Just like they're constant reminders that they're there for you. They probably know you're struggling and they love you regardless. They're going to love you through it. And then you mentioned me, which... I probably played the role of like a supportive community Mm -hmm. of people. So you have the consistency, you have the community. Is there anything else that you would add to that? I think for a partner or a spouse, I think the most important thing you can do is try to understand. And I don't think you ever will. I don't think you're ever capable of understanding someone's mental illness fully because it goes on in someone's mind and it's a devil and angel battle. There's no way it, it's all these like negative thoughts I had made no sense. They were crazy and they had no foundation to them, but I was convinced to my soul that they were true. So trying to explain that to someone who isn't going through it is crazy. Like for you to understand that fully is impossible. But I think as a spouse for you to sit there and say, explain this to me. How are you feeling? Why are you feeling this way? And don't ever tell them they're wrong, I think is the most important thing. Mm. And another note we had a question was how, how was you communicating your addiction? What was that process like? And I think, yeah, it didn't happen over one conversation. Mm -mm. It was a process Mm -hmm. took probably years and probably still is continuing. So that's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. where it's not just going to be like one heart to heart conversation in one night. I think having the conversation with your spouse or partner is the same as asking for help from a therapist because you have to admit that there's something wrong and admitting that to someone you love so much that you're afraid you're going to scare away is terrifying. But as your spouse, we all have crap. We all have insecurities. We all have 
We all make mistakes. We're all human beings. We all have baggage. And if someone runs because of your baggage, then maybe they're not the ones for you. Because as a spouse, you have to support each other through the crap. I would argue if someone runs because your baggage is because some baggage they have, maybe. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. Do you feel like as you've healed through that first addiction or issue, you developed in place of it another one? I think I did for years. I think you did. Yeah. Reflecting back on it, I agree. I think I did for years. I think I transferred my obsession from gymnastics to eating disorder and eating disorder to Adderall and Adderall to maybe alcohol at a time and then alcohol to what I looked like and what I wore and then that to I remember I went through a really unhealthy phase around the time we started dating with like the gym and working out Mm -hmm. and working out nine hours a day and I did that for a very long time until I got so tired of it that I ended up asking for more and more help from you, from a therapist, from professionals, to where I could finally, over a lot of time, work to not do that. And I think I still feel that tendency a lot, um, whether it's obsessing over motherhood or parenting or the postpartum body or whatever it might be. But I'm so hyper aware of it now that whenever I feel it creeping on, I talk to Andrew and I I say, I feel insecure about this or I feel Mm. this obsession or I feel this unhealthy trait coming on. Will you help me? Today's episode is also brought to you by Butcher Box. Babe, do you know what today is? No, what is it? It's Cinco de Mayo. (laughs) And you know what that means? We're gonna get some of that Butcher Box meat out of the fridge and we're gonna make some tacos. I'm thinking that we grab some 100% grass-fed and pasture-raised beef and some of the free-range USDA certified organic chicken. So we have a little chicken tacos, little steak tacos. We're set. Um, That sounds amazing. I'm definitely in. Can I just say I love ButcherBox so much and the fact that they deliver the highest quality meats right to our door is incredible. I know. I think we use them pretty much every night that we (laughs) We cook in. They have excellent chicken, excellent wings excellent steak excellent burgers the freaking the whole thing is great we really do use them almost every day and the best part is how affordable it is it saves me time which is great as a mom and money which i love i also love that i know i never thought i'd hear you say that i know we do say this a lot but we mean it we love butcher box for so many reasons one because they have a fantastic product their meat is top notch but also they really care about who and where they source their meat from which is really important And today we have a special offer for our listeners. You can get the essentials bundle that includes chicken breasts, pork chops, and ground beef free in the first box. Simply visit butcherbox.com slash couple to get started with ButcherBox today. That's butcherbox.com slash couple. We'll link that down below as well. And let's get back to it. One thing we've talked about, I would like to briefly mention is... We watched a documentary called The Weight of Gold about mm. Olympic athletes and, and their struggle with, with mental health. Do you feel like it's almost a trait to a, a trait of people who are elite athletes, probably in particular, maybe elite anything, that they are unbalanced and unhealthy in some sense of the word? A thousand percent. Yeah. I think in order to be at the top of whatever it is you are, you tip the scales of a healthy balance in life and have to have an extreme mentality to achieve something extreme to achieve something extreme yeah and i think coming back from that is very very hard and i think that's why you see a lot of very unhealthy former professional athletes absolutely and i mean former presidents of companies and ceos and anybody who is who is at the peak of their career, that's a very hard transition to make. Do you feel like you would recommend therapy to everybody (laughs) going through something like this? Um, And and if you do, or, or for who you recommend it for, when would you recommend them seeking help? I say this now, had I heard this back when I was 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, I would have brushed it off and laughed at myself. I think everybody should go to therapy. Every single person in the world should go to therapy. 
or to should talk to a therapist because it's just someone to see a different perspective from you. And it's just someone who's a professional who can say, maybe we're taking this a little too far. And I think if we all had that proactive person in our life, an outsider who just had their own professional opinion, it would help a lot of people. But in regards to like outside of that, in regards to anybody struggling, I think if you are struggling, if in your heart, you know, you're struggling, which you do. Anybody who is struggling with a mental illness knows somewhere inside of them that they're having a hard time. It is the hardest thing you will ever do, but you should a thousand percent ask for help. And we, we will include resources to get you started on that journey down below. So check that out. Um, and I want to reiterate with that too, that doesn't mean you're weak. That means you are so incredibly strong. It takes such a strong person to ask for help and to not feel like they can take on the world themselves. And I think as like an athlete, for me to accept the fact that I needed another coach in my life, that took, that took guts. But I looked at it as a coach. It was like, okay, I can't figure this out myself. I need, I need you to direct me. It's humbling to realize, and the older I get, the more I realize it, that the, the human brain is fragile. Mm-hmm. And it just takes, it can take one small thing to be the straw on the camel's back, right? That breaks the camel's back. It makes me think of uh, in my sport, football specialists is a position where it's like punters, kickers, and long snappers. I know of many stories where people of that position were professionals at it and the best in their position for, it could be 10 plus years. And then they come out one day for practice and whatever happened in one case, I remember it was divorce. I don't know about the, the other handful of cases, uh, what was the thing, but all of a sudden they get like a case of the yips essentially. Mm-hmm. And you have, they, they have no more confidence and it applies like that concept of it could just be one little thing that pushes you over the edge to mm-hmm. unhealthiness. I think that's why therapy is a good idea. Mm-hmm. We're not like freaking, we're not even really that way. No, but it's more of a realization. Like you said, of us getting coaching mm-hmm. and understanding that it's important to be proactive about. Well, and it's, it's just constant self-reflection. And I remember too, I think we should see a therapist because we're talking about this. And I think I should continue to see a therapist, which I, I talk to mine every once in a while, but probably not enough. Um, but I remember when we got pregnant with Drew and we got close to like time to have her, I sat Andrew down and I was like, I have to be honest with you. I am terrified of postpartum depression. Having gone through an eating disorder, having gone through the mental illness, having gone through depression before, I'm terrified this is going to happen to me. So if I say, I don't even remember what the list was, but it was, I like wrote out a list for him. If I'm saying these things, if I'm acting this way, if I'm seeming standoffish, any of it, I was like, I need you to tell me to call a therapist. Like I need you to help me because I don't want to get get back to where I was years ago. And I think just having those kind of boundaries within your life are really, really helpful. Can I tell you this? Yes. And those listening to part of the healing process is knowing what your identity is Mm -hmm. and who you are. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you that you are loved, that you are special, that you have a purpose, that you're the, the son or daughter mm-hmm. of the king of the universe, honestly, the creator, whatever that is to you. And you're here for a reason. You're accepted. There are people out there who love you. There's a community out there who can help you. And there are ways to get help. So whatever, I, I think that's important to say that just like we talk about in arguments as a couple, the end, the end goal and the end result is always that we are standing there together married still. Mm-hmm. As you go through this journey, I want that to be what you think of, that you are loved, that you have a purpose, that you're good enough, and that you're the, the son or daughter of, a, of the creator. And that equips you with everything you need. 
I feel like it might take you a while to realize that, but there's a certain amount of confidence that you're able to glean from that though. The more you understand that, the better off you'll equip yourself, I think. I agree. So I love you, babe. I love you, baby. Thank you for talking about that. I know that was hard. Yeah. No, I, it's not hard anymore because I am at a good point in my life. It's only hard for me because it makes me sad to think about myself as a kid who is so consumed by it. And hopefully this helps one person out there not have to go through that or heal from it. That makes, that makes it worth it. Hmm. Well, do you have anything else? No, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. I hope that these stories and this conversation was healing or enjoyable or important to you in some way. That's our goal with it. And uh, again, we want to include you and equip you with whatever resources we're able to. You can see those down below. And uh, would love to hear feedback on this. So please subscribe to the show and, and give it a rating, a comment where you can. And that's all we have, babe. I love you. I love you. I'm Andrew. I'm Sean. We're the East Fam. Out.